In this video, we're going to talk about the linear approximation or tangent plane approximation for a surface. So this is related very much to our notion of the linear approximation or tangent line approximation from Calc 1. And there we said that if x is close to the number a, then this L of x, which is just the equation of the tangent line, is a good approximation for f of x. And we worked out examples like the following. We said, let's estimate radical 62. Well, our function is f of x equals radical x. Now, radical 62 is close to radical 64, which I know to be 8. And the derivative, f prime of x, would be 1 over 2 radical x. So f prime at my number a would be 1 over 2 radical 64, which is just 1 16th. So then I use my linear approximation to approximate the value of radical 62, work out some of the arithmetic there, and I get an approximation of 7.875. Now, I can't write down the exact value of radical 62 as a decimal because it's an irrational number, but using my calculator, and I'll call that the exact value in quotation marks, uh, I get 7.8740078.74. So I get a very good approximation from my equation of the tangent line. And really, that's, that's the point. When x is near a, the tangent line is a good approximation for the function. Well, you know, we could say uh, something very similar about um, a two-dimensional linear approximation. The equation of the tangent plane at a specific point should be a good approximation. If you're close to that point P, it should be a good approximation for the surface. So uh, now I'm going to have a new capital L. It's going to depend on both X and Y, and that's going to be the equation for the tangent plane. And so uh, here our point uh, in the domain is a comma b. And so uh, this is just written a slightly different form what we saw in the previous video on the equation of a tangent plane. We still have an initial value of z, but we write it as f of a comma b. We still have the partial with respect to x, and this is the change in x. We have the partial with respect to y and the change in y. So that's our equation of the tangent plane is what our L of x comma y is. And if I have a point x comma y which is close to a comma b, this L of x comma y should be a good approximation to the surface. Well, why would we use this? Well, we don't have uh, as many neat examples like we did with radical 62, uh, but there is a theoretical use of this. In Calc 1, uh, we defined differentiability. We just barely touched on it. Maybe you didn't even see this notion, but it's a pretty simple idea, even though there's a lot of complicated symbols here. We're just going to start with delta y as being the difference between f of a plus delta x and f of a. Simple idea. And then we're going to say that the function f is differentiable at x equals a, provided that there's a function epsilon, so this is the Greek letter e, epsilon, such that my delta y is, well, this is essentially the equation of part of the equation from the tangent plane plus this bit over here. So epsilon really stands for an error function. So what we're saying is that ah, my, my change in y along the, the, the function is essentially going to be the change on the tangent plane plus 
a little bit of an error. And we're going to say it's differentiable if the error goes to zero as delta x goes to zero. So in other words, we want the uh, tangent line approximation to get arbit arbitrarily close to the function value as x approaches a. But really, all this boils down to in Calc 1 is that if f prime of a exists, f is differentiable at a. And that's all we need. Um, Calc 3, it's very similar. Um, we're going to have a delta z be the change in the function value as you go a little bit away from a and a little bit away from b. So you're going to move a, a little bit uh, delta x, a little delta y. That's going to give me my change in the surface value. And we're going to say that the function of two variables is differentiable, provided that we've got two error functions such that the change in z can be expressed as the change from the tangent plane plus these error functions. And we'll say it's differentiable if these error functions go to zero as we get closer and closer to the particular point. So this is saying that the tangent plane approximation gets arbitrarily close to the function value as x and y approaches a and b. Now granted, this is a little bit complicated to state, not a very useful test to determine if um, a particular function is differentiable at a comma b, but we do have this very useful the theorem which is what we would hope is true, that if both the partial derivatives exist near AB, and they have to be continuous too at AB, then uh, F is differentiable at the point A comma B. Now related to the uh, tangent line approximation, we made use of the differentials. Now remember here, we said that dy equals f prime of dx. Differentials are just variables. So the dx is an independent variable. It's in with differentials, dx, the independent variables are the same as delta x. So that's just some change in the input. And then dy is the uh, dependent variable. And we hope that the dy you think of in this case is the change in y in the tangent line approximation. And we expect that to be close to our delta y, which is the change in the function. So in Calc 3, we're going to have a similar idea, but the, so our change in z in the tangent line approximation, that's what dz is dx and dy, again, are just independent variables. For the independent variables, dx is the same as delta x, uh, dy is the same as delta y. It's just a change in x and y. Uh, but dz is the change in the tangent line approximation, which should be close to delta z. Delta z is the change in the actual surface. And this is what we call the total differential. We say it's the total differential because uh, we, we get the partial from a, x and the partial from y, and we sum them together to get the total. So how can we make use of this? Well, here's an example. Suppose you have a solid cylinder. Well, based on the dimensions, I really should call this a disk because it's much wider than it is tall. So its radius is uh, 7.3 millimeters, plus or minus 0 0.1 millimeters. The height is measured to be 1.5 millimeters, plus or minus uh, 0 0.1 millimeters. If we use these measurements, so the 7.3 and the 1.5, to calculate the volume, what's the largest possible error introduced by this measurement error? Well, we can use our differential. The actual change in the volume could be estimated by the change in the 
total differential or from the action at the change in the total by the total differential, which would be the partial of the volume with respect to R times the delta R plus the partial of the volume with respect to H times the delta H. Remembering that delta R is the same as dr, delta H is the same as dH. And in this case, that would be our error in measurement, 0 0.1. Same thing for H. Now remember the volume of a cylinder is just pi r squared. So the partial of V with respect to R is 2 pi r. That's the lateral surface area. And the partial of V with respect to H is pi r squared, which would be the surface of the top or the bottom. And so uh, now substituting the 2 pi r with our given values or measured values of r and h, 2 pi r h times delta r plus pi r squared times delta h, that turns out to be about 23.6 cubic millimeters as our maximum volume.